The Embankment Written and read by TARDIS 9 Based on the railway series by the Reverend Wilbert Audrey and Thomas and Friends created by Grit Allcroft and David Mitten Now Thomas is as happy as can be. He has a branch line all to himself and puffs proudly backwards and forwards with two coaches all day. He is never lonely. Edward and Henry stop quite often and tell him the news. Gordon is always in a hurry, but never forgets to whistle poop poop, and Thomas always whistles peep peep in return. Of course, Thomas wasn't always the only engine on the branch line. There were also the coffee pots. They were unusual little engines. Each had four wheels, a bunker at one end and a platform at the other, with a boiler pointing upwards right in the middle of them. One was called Gladys, and the other was called Philip. Both engines usually worked at Fafarquhar Quarry, though they also brought trucks down from there for Thomas to take to the junction. Gladys was a kindly sort of engine. Polite, well-mannered and wise, she would always offer a kind word to anyone who came for her for comfort and assistance. She would always offer a kind word to anyone who came to her for comfort and assistance. Philip, on the other hand, was a different sort of engine. Cocky, brash and very blunt. He often spoke his mind on any subject broached to him and nearly always failed to keep his opinions to himself. Everyone who came to the quarry regularly made it a point to always check the numbers on each engine before they spoke to them. Gladys was two and Philip three. There had originally been a number one but he had been sent for scrap some time ago. One November morning, Thomas was making his way up to the quarry. It was a wet and cloudy day. Fog had arrived on the island, making everything harder to see. As if that wasn't enough, the rain had made the rails slippery and the empty trucks were hard to handle. Oh, thank goodness my sanding gear works, thought Thomas. He forged onwards through the fog and rain, as he made his way along the line with his train. Then, as he rounded the bend, he saw... Cinders and ashes! he cried. There in front of him was a goods train. Fearing a collision, his driver slammed on the brakes. Thomas tried hard to stop in time as his wheels skidded along the wet rails. But then, he felt his boiler turn icy cold. Right in front of him, he could see an engine come up and off the rails and tumble down the embankment. The engine in question had no clear number on their side. That had been hidden by the debris. Yet it was a small red engine with four wheels and a boiler that pointed upwards. Thomas gasped. <laughs> that looks like one of the coffee pots, he cried. His crew went to check the line ahead for any damage. They came back looking relieved. <sighs> no major damage to the line ahead, the fireman told him. Come on, Thomas, we're blocking the line at this rate. We must get these trucks to the quarry, said the driver. What? But how? said Thomas. Well, surely if there's been an accident, we must go back and report it. Get a crane out at least. We can do all that at the quarry, the fireman replied. The important thing is... The line ahead is undamaged, and we're the only thing in section at present. Rarely, Thomas puffed past the wreckage. He thought there was something familiar about that engine, but couldn't quite put his coupling on it. It looked to him like Gladys or Philip, 
However, whoever it was clearly needed help. He hurried on with his trucks. When they got to the quarry, the driver jumped down and telephoned up the line. When they got to the quarry, the driver jumped down and telephoned up the line. Edward was sent with the breakdown train. He arrived at the quarry with a grim expression on his face. No wreckage on the line side, he said, and the workmen can't find any damage to the track either. But that's just it, said Thomas. I know I saw a crash. I just don't know how it could have been done without damaging the rails. He looked sad. I know what I saw, he said mournfully. Edward could see he wasn't lying. In the distance, he could hear a small whistle. Gladys appeared around the bend with a train of loaded trucks for the sidings. She shunted the trucks away and came to a halt beside them. Whatever's the matter? she asked. Edward explained what Thomas had seen. She went pale. It's happening again she whispered to herself. What's happening? asked Thomas. They were rudely interrupted by a loud whistle as Philip emerged around the corner with a train of loaded stone trucks he was taking to the junction. Ha <laughs> ha! Not seen that so-called spectre again, are we? He chuckled rudely before disappearing round the bend and making his way down the line. Gladys watched him and sighed. <sighs> I wouldn't be so surprised if that spectre was meant for him, if I'm honest. Indeed, said Edward, and that was sort of how number one went too. Who is number one? asked Thomas. He worked on the line until about the time you arrived, explained Gladys. He didn't have a name, or well, they didn't consider that when he was built, so when Philip and I were built, we decided to name him Glynn. We felt that all good engines should have names, you understand? We liked working with Glynn. He was a good engine, kind, helpful, if a little cheeky. But he was never that good at taking care of himself, you see. He never seemed to notice when his water was running low or when he needed more coal. He just kept on putting others first. Gladys sighed sadly. She did not want to say any more. Edward realised this and continued. A few months ago, Glynn started seeing something strange in the yards at Fafarquhar. It seemed to be bits of an engine lying about the place. Buffers, coupling hooks, wheels, even cab controls just sat on the ground. They didn't even look like they had been cut away from an engine. <sighs> Glynn was horrified by this and would not calm down until he had seen the other engines and made certain they were all right. Then he looked back at the station, only to find nothing there. He was certain he had seen something, but no one seemed to listen. But as time went on, I began to see it too. Philip took no notice, he was too concerned with his trucks and would always just laugh at us and call us silly whenever we spoke about it. One morning, Glynn was in the yard. He had just finished shunting and had neglected to tell his crew how thirsty he was feeling. He just wanted to get his job done. Oh, but he let his boiler get too warm. He built up too much pressure. His firebox crown melted. Steam began to leak in all directions. Finally, just after his crew had the good sense to get clear, he exploded, finished Edward gravely. It took the workmen all afternoon to clear up the mess, Gladys said sadly. There wasn't much left of Glynn and what was left was sent for... For... For what? asked Thomas. Scrap, said Edward simply. Thomas gulped. It seems that spectre presented itself as a warning continued Edward gravely as he puffed off home. And now that you've seen this vision of yours, Thomas, 
I'd take care if I were you three. That evening, Gladys tried explaining everything to Philip, but he wouldn't listen. You silly engines just seem to take that old carriage's tail far too seriously, he retorted. There's absolutely nothing to be concerned about. That's just what we thought last time, protested Gladys. And look what happened to Glynn. Pah, snorted Philip. Glynn was falling apart at the seams anyway, going by all that black muck he was spilling out. How dare you say that about him, scolded Gladys. He was ten times the engine you are. He couldn't help it if he had a few mechanical faults. Pshaw, grunted Philip. Now go to sleep like a sensible engine and stop talking nonsense. Months went by. Every day, Thomas would bring his trucks from the junction to the top station. From there, either Gladys or Philip would take them on and bring down loaded ones for him to take away. Sometimes, when they were too busy, Thomas would take them up and down the quarry tramway himself. But he was always most careful when he went by the spot where he had seen the wreckage. He knew what he had seen, and he hoped it would never come true. One morning, he arrived up at the quarry with some empty trucks. Gladys wasn't steaming properly, so he was needed to help shunt the trucks into their proper places before he could take his trains. As he took on water, he could see Gladys in the shed. She looked pale and tired. Clearly, something had been keeping her awake. What happened? Thomas asked. There's another one, stammered Gladys, quaking like a leaf. I, I saw it last night. It sat on the rails last night, right on my l line in front of my... B -b 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 what did it look like? asked Thomas. All rusted and broken, explained Gladys in deep fear. Like it was going to be... Scrapped? asked Thomas worriedly. Yes, Gladys replied. Thomas looked at her deeply. He wanted to help his friend, but he didn't know how. He could tell that all this was scaring her. He knew her to be a wise, kindly sort of engine. After all, they had spoken often together, and he had looked to her for advice and guidance on how to run the branch line. So to see her feel scared and frightened because of these spectres troubled him deeply, and he could do nothing to help her. Sighing heavily, he vowed then and there to remain vigilant around these spectres and to always support her. He took a deep breath. <sighs> Gladys, he said, I swear to you now, no matter what may happen, I will always support you. If you would ever crash, I would bring the workmen and cranes to you. If ever I found you on the scrap lines, I would do my utmost to save you. And if you really were scrapped, I should never forget you. You are far too important to me. Thank you, Thomas. Gladys let out a small smile. Whistling bravely, Thomas collected his trucks and started off. Gladys was all alone. Nothing moved, save for the workmen at their work. Not a sound was heard that she didn't recognise. Not a wheel or single bolt turned out of place. Boom! Suddenly, a line of trucks went flying right past the shed. Gladys screamed in terror as Philip came laughing from behind the shed. <laughs> oh, I heard you two talking. He laughed before mimicking. Oh, I'm so scared. I'm going to be scrapped. Stop mocking me, fumed Gladys. Oh, temper, temper, smirked Philip. We don't want your ghost to hear you. Otherwise, he might come back and spook you. Ooh, 
Philip began imitating a ghost. I'm a scrap engine, he said in a mock ghostly voice. It's not funny, Philip, Gladys retorted. <sighs> well, maybe not to a gullible old wreck like you, Philip sneered. But from where I'm standing, <laughs> it's utterly hilarious. <laughs> and he scuttled away, laughing rudely before Gladys could say another word. Gladys, fed up with Philip's taunting, sighed and said nothing. One way or another, she had a feeling things would turn out very badly for them. The years passed. The line became busier and busier still. More traffic was needed. Worse still was that a new law had been introduced demanding that all engines on public roads should wear cow catchers and side plates. In a bid to avoid any further legal difficulties following Thomas's misadventure, the Fat Controller had purchased a tram engine from the mainland. This meant that the coffee pot's future looked ever more uncertain, and there was talk of them being withdrawn from service. One wet and misty evening, Philip and Gladys were shunting in the quarry. That useless old wooden shack, grumbled Philip. First he comes over here and takes over our work, then he doesn't even come when he's supposed to. Calm down, soothed Gladys. She was supposed to be taking some loaded trucks to Fafarqua, but her pipes needed cleaning after she had accidentally coughed up some dirty water. It's no point grumbling about it when it was bound to happen eventually, she continued patiently. Pah! Philip retorted. If he didn't come here and stick his funnel into our business, we'd have a better future than this and still be just fine handling our work. He bumped his trucks hard. And mind how you go, warned Gladys. You've been banging those trucks around for days now. You know what will happen if you keep this up. And when was the last time we were ever repaired, eh? All those complaints about your axles aching and now you rush around like you're freshly built. You'll damage yourself tearing around like that. Philip just snorted and decided to ignore her. He buffered up to his trucks and was coupled on. The guard shone his green lamp and Philip snorted away. His axle ached, harder than ever before, he noticed, but he decided to ignore it. It would only mean being replaced by the new engine if he didn't. He was still fuming over what Gladys had said to him. Oh, that miserable old kettle, he thought. If she spent more time actually working and less time fretting over tiny things, we'd actually get things done and that old shed wouldn't be here. He passed the place where Thomas had first seen the ghosts. He couldn't resist a sneer at it as he went by. Sha, stupid old ghosts, he said aloud. Nothing's going to stop me, ever. Still in a foul mood, he pulled in at Fafarqua and shunted his trucks into a siding. Um, excuse me, are those my trucks? came a voice. Philip stared in the direction that the voice had come from. There in front of him was a steam tram with a wooden body, two cow catchers and two side plates. What's it to you? Philip snorted. Oh, just that I've got a train to take down, the tram replied. I brought up some trucks for the quarry. I'd take them myself, but I'm due to pick up some other goods at the farms along the line in a few minutes. <sighs> well, I'm not stopping you, said Philip. He moved away from the loaded trucks and back down onto the empties. The tram engine buffered up to the loaded ones. He looked hopefully at Philip. By the way, he started. My name's Tom. Do you honestly think I care what your name is? Philip snorted. You think you can come over to this line smart as you like and take over our work? Thomas did, observed the tram engine. <sighs> Thomas does passenger and goods work. In case you haven't noticed, I'm not a passenger engine, scoffed Philip. And anyway, 
We run the quarry, not him, and definitely not a useless pile of wood like you. Call yourself an engine, you're a disgrace to the rails. Now excuse me, but I have a train to pull. The tram engine was cross. You'll come to a sorry end with an attitude like that, he warned. <laughs> Not if I have my way, I won't, Philip replied sharply. He started away with a jerk on his couplings. Ow, 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 screamed the trucks. What was that for? Ah, shut up, snorted Philip. You're almost as bad as that feckless sister of mine and that miserable old stack of rotten wood put together. The trucks were horrified. They had always been fond of Gladys and had come to like the new engine. They always treated them firmly but kindly and never bumped them unless they had misbehaved. But the trucks had never liked Philip. He had been far too rough for their liking and to hear him say this about both Gladys and the newcomer was the last straw. They began to whisper amongst themselves. What it was... I cannot say, since Philip was having troubles of his own. The faster he went, the more his axles seemed to ache. The day was cold and wet. Fog surrounded the branch line. The rails were slippery, rain pelted down and visibility was poor. Philip could barely see the buffers in front of him, let alone the line ahead. As he puffed onwards, he began to pick up speed. His axles ached, but he wanted to complete his work in good time. And so he forged on ahead regardless. The trucks, knowing how bad the conditions of both the weather and Philip's axles were, decided to seize the opportunity. They banged their buffers together and soon the whole train began to go faster. On, 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 they cried. Stop, stop, wailed Philip. But it was no use. The trucks just laughed and continued pushing him onwards. Philip's axles ached worse than ever before. It seemed like all the strain of fighting against the surging trucks combined with the train's high speed seemed to be making it worse. Faster and faster his wheels span. The pain became worse and worse. He groaned inwardly. There seemed to be a crack in his axle. The more pain he endured, the bigger it felt it was becoming. Finally, snap! One of Philip's driving wheels fell away from him. Instantly, just as his crew had managed to jump clear, he feared to one side, the trucks pushing him onwards down the embankment. His coupling rod caught in the earth, but the speed was such that it bent upwards. He kept on falling and falling with the sound of the truck's laughter still ringing in his smoke box. The last thing he ever saw was a familiar looking field and it was coming very fast towards him. Thomas was collecting passengers at Fafarqua with Annie and Clarabel when the station master ran up. Leave those coaches here please Thomas, he said. There's been an accident on the quarry tram road one of the coffee pots has already brought some workmen to the site and Edward is bringing the breakdown gang. You'll need to fetch Terence and take him to the site. Thomas gasped. <gasps> An image flashed in his mind. He hoped that... No, no, surely it couldn't be. No, that was impossible. Wasn't it? He coupled up to a flatbed and then shunted it to the farm where Terence was waiting. As soon as the little tractor was loaded onto the truck, they set off up the line. Thomas dreaded what would come next. As they carefully made their way through the rain and fog, they could eventually see the shape of a brake van. Thomas stopped. He let out a gasp. <gasps> then he fell silent. The brake van and some trucks stood on the rails, while the rest of the trucks were piled in a heap at the bottom of the embankment. And right at the bottom of the pile, in and amongst the debris, was the shape of an engine. A shape that had a very distinctive vertical boiler.
Thomas heard a familiar whistle sound. Looking up, he was overwhelmed with relief when he saw Gladys coming towards him. But this feeling didn't last. He eventually realised who was at the bottom of the pile. Grimly, Terence set to work, pulling the wreckage closer to the line side for it to be lifted up and taken away. Thomas took the unhurt trucks away and Edward arrived with the breakdown chain. Later, Thomas, Annie and Clarabelle were waiting at Ellsbridge with their last passenger train of the day when they saw Edward steam past, looking very serious and forlorn. Behind him came some cranes and a flat truck with the battered remains of Philip, wheel missing with no hope of repairs. Philip was scrapped the very next day. Thomas wasn't sure how Gladys would take it, but he remembered what he had seen that night. Perhaps, could it have been a warning? A warning to Philip not to overexert himself. These thoughts went around Thomas's smoke box. He never saw Gladys again. She was bought by the Vickerstown Railway Museum and taken into their workshops for restoration. After that, life on the branch line seemed to settle down. Thomas and the new engine became good friends, especially after the new engine introduced himself as Toby and frightened a certain policeman. But neither of them ever forgot that terrible day, and nor did Gladys. She's still there, at the railway museum, on static display, watching visitors come in and out of the building and spending her time deep in conversation with Diesel, Innie, Jim, Neil, Eagle, Subasa, and the other exhibits in the museum. Thomas often thinks of her. Ah, <sighs> oh, well, he says to himself, now that that's happened, <laughs> Perhaps there'll be no more bother of these spirits. But Thomas is wrong. Late at night, the museum engines are locked away. The windows are never kept open, but even so, Gladys never dares to look outside. Because then she knows she can see it, and she knows full well what it means for her. It is the white shape of a coffee pot energy. It is rusted and broken. It is her future. And, one way or another, it will be coming for her. I think so. Don't you?